Hello and welcome to the first ABC blockchain talk after the summer break. Uh, today uh, we are streaming from Bitpanda HQ and we have a really interesting topic uh, uh, for the talk, uh, namely blockchain interoperability. For that uh, we have uh, Alexander Neulinger from uh, Academia, from ABC Research, but as well people from uh, the practical side of things, Leon and Markus from Pantos and Witt from Raiffeisen. Uh, from uh, the setup of the, uh, the talk, we will first hear uh, a few perspectives from uh, research from Alexander, uh, so a brief presentation, about 15 minutes, and afterwards we will have a, an extended panel discussion uh, where we will discuss uh, blockchain interoperability, the current status, the trends in the future from vari various perspectives. Of course, you have the possibility to uh, ask questions. Please do so in the uh, live stream. Uh, at the end of the talk, we will have a special uh, section where we try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, as you know, the ABC uh, research, uh, our task, one of our tasks is to ra raise awareness and bring together people from academia, business and the tech community. Uh, in that regard, we host a lot of events. Just check out uh, our LinkedIn page or, and our website. And maybe as a save the date right now, in May 2023, we will have our big ABC conference. Uh, my name is Vincent Streitl. I'm an area manager for economics and business at ABC. Uh, but enough about me. Uh, with that, I hand it over to Alexander for his talk. Yep. Thank you, Vincent. So let's dive into the current status and trends in blockchain interoperability. Um, so we're heading towards a multi-blockchain world because um, of fundamental trade-offs in blockchain technology. For example, there's the scalability trilemma, which is a trade-off between um, security, decentralization, and scalability um, in blockchains. So there's not a one-size-fits-all um, blockchain, and interoperability could help um, uh, yeah, establishing such a multi-blockchain world where those um, blockchains are connected with each other. So we see um, trends in crypto field, like increasing number of blockchains for that reason, also an increasing, increasing number of assets, and the user demand to interact with those assets and those different blockchains. And as Sunny Agrawal um, put it, um, blockchain interoperability allows blockchains to optimize um, the core logic to a specific use case. Um, and how does it look? So um, blockchain interoperability enables a multi-blockchain world. For example, um, a blockchain interoperability mechanism can connect two different blockchains with each other, allowing different functions. For example, um, the exchange of cryptocurrencies between different um, participants of different blockchains. Um, and here are the basic um, concepts of blockchain interoperability. We have the blockchain interoperability mechanisms, the solutions and the functions. The blockchain interoperability mechanisms, they are the basic technical concepts um, which the blockchain inter interoperability solutions like Rootstock, Polkadot, Pantos and Cosmos and many more utilize to enable blockchain interoperability functions. And those functions, um, they should deliver um, services, for example, token transfers. In this small example, you see um, a digital twin that moves from one um, um, blockchain-based supply chain to another blockchain-based supply chain. Um, and let's have a look at those functions in a bit more detail. So for example, there are atomic swaps and token portability, which are common examples of blockchain interoperability functions. Um, the atomic swaps um, should enable the exchange of, of um, tokens between different um, participants of different blockchains. For example, in this example, Alice wants to um, buy her tokenized train ticket using her tokenized um, money. And the important thing of an atomic swap is um, to reduce the counterparty risk so that Alice cannot end up um, losing her tokenized money and not getting her tokenized train ticket. So it should enable um, de delivery versus, uh, versus payment. Another function is, for example, token portability. As we said before, there's a tokenized twin that moves from one blockchain to another. And the important thing here is that uh, on the initial blockchain, this digital twin is either locked or burned. 
and on the other blockchain it's created or minted. And the important is that this um, on the initial blockchain that the digital twin stays blocked or burned, um, so that we avoid double spending between uh, different blockchains. Um, and regarding the blockchain interoperability solutions, so here we have um, a very thorough survey paper of Belcher and his research team from last year. Um, on the right side of this graph, we see a list of um, solutions, which are the references, which the authors um, categorized using the attributes in the middle. And the categories they came up with are the um, public connectors, which are the first three um, subcategories, relays, uh, notary schemes, hash time lock contracts, for example. The second connector type is the blockchain of blockchain, um, which is a rather new um, solution approach, um, where the solution creates some kind of meta blockchain connecting different blockchains with each other. And the, the last um, connector type they came up with, with are hybrid connectors, which is probably the, the newest approach, um, which um, should connect public and private net, um, blockchains with each other. Um, yeah, and the first, the first um, basic blockchain interoperability mechanisms were described by Vitalik Buterin in 2016. So you can see here that the whole concept is, a rather, is still rather new. Um, and Buterin um, proposed three different mechanisms. So first, um, there could be a, a notary or notary scheme, um, which enables communication between two different blockchains um, in some kind of indirect way. So every communication goes through a trusted third party. Um, another um, proposal of Buterin is some, some kind of uh, sidechain or relay scheme, which enables a more direct communication between relays who participate in both blockchains. It is um, a more direct approach than the other, than the notary scheme, but also technically um, it produces more overhead. So it's more costly usually. And the last um, uh, mechanism proposed by Buterin is the manual um, asset exchange, facilitated by um, hashed time lock contracts. Um, it is a very convenient um, mechanism to exchange assets, but that's also its, its, advantage, uh, its advantage. Disadvantage, um, it can just enable uh, atomic swaps, so these asset exchanges. Sorry. Um, okay, so here we have the top priorities in future blockchain interoperability research. So as we said before, blockchain interoperability is a very young and trending research topic. So it was, um, you can barely see the, the, um, the line here. It was first mentioned in 2016 by Vitalik Buterin and since then uh, research went up sharply. Um, still the research mostly um, focused on functionality and it still lacks some practical focus. So there are peer-reviewed, um, this peer-reviewed blockchain interoperability research that has no implementation, and there are blockchain interoperability implementations that are not based on peer-reviewed research. And this is one of the reasons why blockchain interoperability um, is also accountable for the majority of exploits in the crypto space in this year. So we um, saw crypto assets stolen worth more than $2 billion um, dollars just in 2022. And as Belcher and his research team also point out, security is still an open issue. And just two weeks ago, we saw um, um, another bridge attack at the Binance um, bridge that even caused the Binance change to be paused for some time. And the reason is, again, that um, blockchain interoperability is still in an early stage of development and that many implementations lack maturity or lack testing. Um, some of the yeah, well-known examples of the exploits of this year are, for example, the Ronin bridge explo exploitation, exploitation um, where the attacker managed to compromise the identity of, um, of one of the identi identities that um, was responsible for the, for the bridge, for the keys. So the reason for that was the lack of decentralization. And wormhole exploit and the nomad exploit both, um, bo in both cases, the attacker could exploit the vulnerability in the smart contract um, source code. Um, and one of the reasons is that they, these projects lacked testing. 
Okay, and there are some blockchain inter interoperability security approaches. So for example, there's a stake-based approach where the bridge validators, they are rewarded, so in financially incentivized to verify the blockchain inter interoperability transactions or cross-chain transactions. But they can also be penalized if they um, don't, don't fulfill their obligations, so if they act malicious, for example. And usually, um, a majority of the validators, for example, more than two-thirds of the, of the validators, have to agree on a transaction to be passed from one blockchain to the other. The reputation-based approach works similar, but here the identities of the bridge validators is known, so they, um, yeah, and they don't want to lose their reputation. And the proof-based approach um, is an approach where, so in comparison to the stake-based and reputation-based approach, where every transaction is um, transmitted immediately, but there's some kind of dispute um, period where one or more honest, um, let's say, watchers, um, which also participate in the bridge solution, um, can dispute um, blockchain inter interoperability transactions in case they think it's a faulty transaction. And the last um, security approach that is listed here um, is the internal, internally verified approach. So this is a more direct approach and it's, uh, let's say, as secure as the connected blockchains, but it's also a very complex approach um, where the security depends on the two blockchains. Yeah, but it's, it's more decentralized usually than the, the other three options. Okay. Here see the references, and yeah, thank you very much for the for your attention, and I'm very looking forward for the panel discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I hand over to you? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation, uh, overview, and and current research trends, and I think um, it, at least with me, uh, I had like tons of questions, of which I hope I get some answers to. But before we do that, maybe. Let's make a quick intro round. Uh, everybody says uh, who he is and why he finds blockchain interesting. Thank you. So first of all, thanks for having me. My name is Witt Hlieber. Um, I'm working for Raiffeisen Bank International for the Blockchain Hub. Um, we are a competence center for blockchain applications across the group. Um, we, on one side, do research work. So we follow the different trends, not just on the cryptocurrency side, but also in general, uh, financial industry and blockchain. Then second of all, um, we are also running pilots. So if we see that there is an interesting use case out there, uh, we try to pilot it and test our hypothesis. Uh, and thirdly, also help to shape uh, group strategy when it comes to blockchain applications. Um, on one side, this means we help to shape the strategy on cryptocurrencies, but also on tokenized assets and what we call digitized money, so stable coins and uh, CBDCs. Um, I came to the space in 2017. Um, first, it was really just a hobby, but then it also became a, a profession. So I'm really happy to, to be able to, to basically mix the, the private and professional interests. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alex, maybe um, um, just yeah. quickly. Okay, thanks. Um, so my name is Alex Neulinger. Um, I'm working at the Austrian Blockchain Center. I'm also studying, uh, making the PhD program at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. And I'm researching, uh, my research focus is on blockchain inter interoperability, especially the business um, aspects of interoperability. And now um, the focus is especially on stable coins, um, I would say. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, guys. So yeah, uh, my name is Leon. I'm the Partnerships Manager at Pantos. So I fully focus on uh, developing strategies to uh, uh, onboard new partners. And I uh, also, uh, with the team together, we are elaborating different frameworks to further build out the Pantos ecosystem. And uh, so in this regard, scale the project to where we want it to be. Yeah, I'm also working for Pantos. I'm Markus Levonek. I'm a blockchain um, engineer for Pantos. I have a background and experience in both academic research and professional software engineering. And my, as well as the whole engineering team of Pantos, responsibility is to transform our research results into a working product in the end. And, and maybe also a quick introduction to, to Pantos itself for anybody who is unfamiliar with it, just a little bit of a background information. 
So Pantus was actually founded in uh, or established in 2017, um, and the reason being is because since the introduction of Bitcoin in, in 2009, a lot of other cryptocurrency-based projects emerged, and uh, back then it was uh, ultimately clear that uh, there was like a shift from from a one cryptocurrency approach to a multiple cryptocurrency approach. So a lot of different uh, other cryptocurrencies emerged, as we all know. And uh, Pantus's mission in this regard was sort of to strengthen the crypto ecosystem by sort of facilitating movement between different crypto uh, cryptocurrencies or blockchains. And um, this uh, this sort of guiding principle slowly transformed into this uh, ultimate goal of uh, achieving true uh, blockchain interoperability. And um, uh, in that regard, we can we can also say that uh, research really laid the foundation for pretty much everything we've done so far. Uh, at Pantos, we are a small team of 10 people and uh, very smart and competent people, actually. And uh, also, we're collaborating with the Christian Doppel Laboratory for the Internet of Things, uh, with uh, Professor Stefan Schulte, as head of lab. And uh, also, of course, the whole team of Bitpanda, because uh, without Bitpanda, there wouldn't be Pantos. Uh, so uh, we are uh, very happy uh, how everything turned out so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I mean, maybe let's start the discussion with an easy question, like uh, Alex gave us a pretty good overview from a rather technical side, I'd say, um, how interoperability works, but from uh, a use case perspective, like what, uh, maybe Mark and Leon uh, goes to you first, uh, interoperability, what use cases as a developer do you have in mind when you develop your solutions? Yeah, <coughs> um, so for Pantos I see two main use cases, so first of all um, we establish a multi-chain asset protocol, so developers can launch um, multi-chain assets on top of Pantos or on top of our interoperability um, solution. And the second one is that even if you don't want um, to launch your own uh, multi-chain asset, it, uh, makes a lot of sense if you want to, for example, develop a decentralized finance application or, or even a centralized finance application um, and you want to connect different um, blockchains, for example, you want to connect a lending protocol on, on blockchain A and, and some other DeFi solution on, on blockchain B and then you want to add your own services on top of that to use Pantos as an interoperability protocol in between to achieve this whole um, solution in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, that sounds sounds interesting. Maybe let's hear the other side, um, because I know you also uh, think a lot about use cases for interoperability and from a more traditional finance perspective, where do you see uh, use cases for interoperability? So first of all, we realize that blockchain interoperability is a challenge that's out there and that also if we want to uh, launch our own, let's say, crypto offering or um, whatever product or service, we have to have this in mind and we have to solve this for, for the users. So we want to uh, give the users a seamless experience uh, in, in the space and we have to take care of this challenge uh, for them. Um, where we mostly focus now our use cases, um, there are two main areas. One of the areas are payments. So here we have in mind um, especially stable coins, but also CBDCs, so central bank digital currencies, which we have to admit that we don't know. Um, if they will be built based on blockchain or not, um, most probably even not. But still, there is a huge, um, actually huge space of stable coins now growing, especially also now with the regulation coming. Um, so this is one of the focus areas. The second focus area would also be tokenized assets. So we are a financial institution um, issuing or helping to issue financial instruments such as bonds, shares, uh, certificates. Um, but also other assets, uh, mm -hmm. commodities and real estate. So we also see that there is a big, big opportunity um, also for the banks here. And of course, um, we ha as already mentioned before, we have to ensure that there is a seamless experience for the user, um, which also means having uh, interoperability in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, <coughs> actually, so payments and, and securitized uh, to or tokenized securities the main focus areas are these like these types of assets because you said like uh, multi-chain assets supported uh, in, in your basic setup of Pantos um. yes um, so we we establish um, a new um, standard basically on top of the of the um, token standards on the on the different blockchains mm -hmm. we support 
which is a multi-chain um, token standard. And yes, so we support natively multi-chain assets on mm. top of Pantos. Okay. And maybe looking a little bit more into the future, uh, Alex, mm -hmm. from an academic perspective, what, what is discussed in the communities and, and academia with regards to future use cases? Mm -hmm. um, with regards to future use cases, um, let's start with a current use case, maybe. Um, Vince, uh, Vince already mentioned before, um, stablecoins, for example. Um, there are some stablecoins issuers who are issuing um, stablecoins natively on different blockchains and enable bridging them between those um, blockchains. For example, Circle is doing that, for example. Mm -hmm. um, also, so you could bridge um, st these stablecoins to other blockchains using other bridges. So st Circle has some, um, allows to um, stablecoins to be bridged natively to some blockchains. And if you want, you can extend that to other blockchains, for example, mm -hmm. as a user. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the trend is going the direction of connecting to more blockchains because those blockchains, they, are focused, they have special properties, for example. And so I think it's a tr real trend that, um, yeah. That, that we are currently seeing. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. to connect different blockchains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> maybe to go to the more technical side now, um, uh, Alex. Um, so you mentioned token transfers, atomic mm -hmm. swaps. Uh, uh, how do they differ from, from a technical perspective? Mm -hmm. So, as I said before, mentioned before, so there are, for example, those um, manual asset exchanges, which is a special blockchain interoperability mechanism, mm -hmm. but they can just be used for token exchanges. Um, but for these token exchanges, they're rather convenient because two participants can, for example, exchange tokens directly with each other. But the thing is, they can just um, exchange the token. So they cannot um, transfer a token from one mm -hmm. blockchain to another using this mechanism. So other more, let's say, complex mechanism have, have to be used for um, doing those token transfers. Mm -hmm. And this is where um, multi-chain projects like Pantos come into to play. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and um, do you guys, what mechanisms do you support uh, actually? Um, so can you transfer swap uh, with Pantos? What's possible from the functionality? Um, yeah, that's um, possible. So um, we basically we support the, um, the exchange of, of tokens from one blockchain to another. By <coughs> um, yeah, we have a, a number of different components, basically mm -hmm. off-chain components and on-chain components. Um, on-chain components meaning. Um, a number of different um, smart contracts, um, a Pantos hub, for example, which is our central um, smart contract, but, but then also a Pantos uh, forwarder, which is um, a smart contract for verifying the security, the, the signatures, for example, on chain, mm -hmm. but then also off chain components. And here, of course, in the, in the center is the validation. So if you have um, a, a transfer of tokens from blockchain A to blockchain B, um, we need to verify that on blockchain A, on the source blockchain, um, the token transfer has actually been included in the blockchain so that it's not uh, been reverted or, or not happened at all or something like that. Um, that is um, verified um, off-chain by our um, validators. And then as soon as that's um, sure and, and the validators have, have confirmed that we are um, um, submitting it or the validators are submitting mm -hmm. it to the to the destination blockchain. Here again, we have a number of on-chain components and in the end, the funds are received by the, the recipient on the destination mm -hmm. blockchain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, you mentioned like, uh, or one, one uh, you mentioned one aspect um, and I think it was in, in your description security because uh, it has to be an elaborate process to, to be secure. And I think talking about interoperability, that's a huge topic now, because there have been so many hacks uh, of interoperability solutions, um, I mean, from, from your perspective or like a developer's perspective, what went wrong? Is there a general like theme? Yeah, I mean, um, very often, probably a lack of, of testing and, and, and also analyzing the whole uh, protocol from various perspectives. I mean, you can do a technical analysis, you can also do an economical analysis, and then, of course, a lot of testing. So many projects probably rushed into the market too mm. fast, and then they, they wanted to be out there to, to gain market shares. And 
yeah, from our perspective, it's important to um, do every step very thoroughly. Um, so, so first, um, design the protocol based on 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 um, well-founded um, research, um, and then um, analyze every step basically from from various perspectives. Test every everything very um, thoroughly, and then um, in the end, even a whole audit of the whole code base. And after that, all you can. Mm. Um, basically, really launch a project. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a long, it's a long process. It takes time, and yeah, that's. And that's the, you've guys been uh, around for a long time, so you doing diligent work, I guess. Um. We do our best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, security. I guess from a banking perspective, if um, you consider any solution to be integrated in in your technology stack, it has to be secure. Um, are there any uh, special things? Uh, uh, you look out uh, for or that, that are especially important from that regard? So I would have two things to say. So first of all, um, yes, we also read about this uh, security, about security and about all these attacks and this is not uh, doing us a favor because also when we're trying to convince our decision makers, they normally, oh, they always hear the negative news but they sometimes, uh, just sometimes they hear the positive news. So this is definitely not in favor also of us um, trying to persuade them and trying to develop a solution here. Um, and the second thing is, yes, security is definitely very important for us um, because this is actually also our USP as a bank. We have the trust of our customers and just imagine what would happen if um, we lost your your money on the bank account. This would probably be um, really bad for us and it could also lead to bank even uh, failing uh, because of that. So this mm. is something that we cannot afford uh, and definitely if or when we are using this, uh, this kind of solution, it has to be really secure. Mm. Um, and maybe also like more the big picture perspective, Alex, you mentioned a trilemma uh, with regards to blockchain interoperability. Mm -hmm. Can you like maybe uh uh, uh, refine on that? Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful. Um, there are several uh, trilemmas in the blockchain space. So one is the blockchain scalability, scalability trilemma, which um, says that a blockchain cannot be decentralized, secure, and fast at the same time. Um, for example, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin, they focus on decentralization and on security. Mm -hmm. And that's why they just allow for some a couple of transactions per second. Meanwhile, other um, networks, they allow many, much more um, transactions per second, but um, they have the disadvantage of lack of security, for example. And then there's also the blockchain interoperability trade-off, which means that the blockchain interoperability solution usually cannot be fast, cheap, and secure at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I guess it's uh, from a developer's perspective, it's pretty difficult to find the right balance here. Yes, <coughs> sure, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we in our research, we, we um, considered many different approaches, for example, for, for this whole validation um, mechanism. We had relay solutions, which are very, very secure. But um, I mean, even though we had uh, many optimizations here, in the end, they still were too expensive. So, so from a practical point of view, they were not um, really usable. So um, we then um, had an, another, um, uh, we had more research on an Oracle-based solution, which is more practical. Mm -hmm. um, it's still um, secure enough, so it's still a very secure solution, but um, also um, cost-wise um, more realistic to, to um, use the mm -hmm. practice. And that's where uh, the approach we basically follow on and, and, and uh, really build our, our product on. Um, yeah, and then also we try to give all the users um, as much choice as possible. So, for example, um, we have a system where our nodes can <coughs> um, offer bits to users mm. and the users can select them. I mean, that doesn't necessarily have to be selected manually. So, bits mean um, um, a transfer has a certain cost and you can select which one you want and then you get a faster transfer, for example, or you get a slower transfer mm -hmm. depending on how much you want to pay for that transfer. But of course, in practice, a user will probably just say, I want to have a fast or a slow transfer and then the client, the, the wallet will select it for the user. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, to some extent, users can uh, choose uh, the balance themselves Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, security is always um, a high priority, so there, there cannot be a lot of compromise on security. Sometimes, if you need to compromise a little bit, but yeah, 
also um, between speed and costs, yeah, mm -hmm. users can have some choice basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, maybe uh, let's let's go to to uh, a different topic, uh, namely the the legal perspectives. Of course, uh, I know financial law. Everybody knows financial institutions have a lot of legal requirements. And with, can you maybe give us a feeling for like what uh, legal requirements or boxes uh, an interoperability solution would have to to tick for you? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is definitely compliance-related topics such as uh, money laundering or anti-money laundering rules mm -hmm. and also um, know your customer rules. So um, here, whether we're using uh, an interoperability solution or not, we have to comply with these rules. Um, but then there are also other, other requirements. Um, I have to admit that now I, I cannot list all the, let's say, regulations or legal acts, but um, from the top of my head, AML and KYC would be um, a, a must-have. Must mm. mm. Of course, like Pantos is a tech provider, you guys are neutral with, with regards to regulation, I guess. So, but how can a solution like Pantos uh, help potential users to, to tick those boxes? Well, um, like you said, uh, Pantos aims to be a decentralized solution and an open source solution. So uh, we uh, ourselves as a project will never implement KYC uh, solutions, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, anybody who wants to build on top of Pantos, on top of the infrastructure of Pantos, can, for example, also implement their own KYC solutions mm -hmm. on top of our underlying infrastructure, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would definitely uh, be a good feature for, for yeah. any highly regulated institution who considers Pantos as a solution. Exactly, for example, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, maybe uh, see if we have some... Uh, Questions from the live stream. Uh, well, let's do the easy ones. Uh, will you share the slides of the presentation? Yes, mm -hmm. we will. Um, um, then maybe when is the open beta? So uh, maybe to uh, to rephrase that, you guys are currently in a closed beta, uh, exactly. and you plan to open that at some point. Can you already? Uh, Exactly. Sneak peek when that's going to happen. Yes, so we, we started with the closed beta. Uh, a memory serves me right, it was at the beginning of summer. So at first it was only accessible to Bitband employees, to our colleagues, mm -hmm. and later to a selected group of testers. And uh, on that note, we were also very happy to receive a lot of positive feedback. Um, so uh, at the, our colleagues as well as the testers were very happy with the product. Uh, and uh, maybe I can, I can really already spoil it. Uh, the open beta will then uh, launch in November. So really not long to go now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so November, that's really yeah, it's pretty next, soon, yeah. <laughs> next that's month. Pretty soon, yeah. So you guys must be pretty stressed actually. I mean, we are managing it. We're, we, we have it under control. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe also a, a question from, from the chat. Um, is RBI involved in the Pantos open beta? Well, um, Simple as, as yeah, as Leon said, if they are launching in November, then uh, we are not yet involved, but definitely we're uh, checking their developments and um, yeah, we we have discussions uh, ongoing. So as you said, you're actively looking in the space, but are not uh, active right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and there's another question that might be interesting for for uh, the. the the audience, so more like a technical question. How long does a Pantos transfer tar, uh, take? Yeah, this um, depends on a, a number of factors actually. <laughs> so on the source blockchain, on the destination blockchain, and on the bit basically which the user selected for his transfer. Yeah, so mm -hmm. <coughs> um, source blockchain, destination blockchain um, means um, so we have blockchains with uh, different block times. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes a different um, amount of time to create a new block. Mm -hmm. And then also um, we need um, to wait for um, a specific number of blocks until we can say uh, a transaction is confirmed on mm -hmm. that blockchain. And this really depends on the blockchain. This can be fast on one blockchain or slow on another. So Ethereum, for example, is rather slow. Other blockchains like um, Avalanche, for example, are faster in mm -hmm. that regard. Mm -hmm. So that is one factor which determines this. And the other one is um, the <coughs> 
the um, bit for the Panthers transfer the user chooses. Um, in that bit, um, we have a maximum execution time, right? Mm -hmm. And this means um, our nodes can also wait for a little bit of time. So if you choose a slower transfer, cheaper transfer, if you, if you say, okay, you, you don't mind if it takes one minute or 10 minutes, for example, um, then our nodes can say, okay, I wait a little bit because I expect that the gas cost will fall and mm -hmm. um, I can submit it um, more cheaply in, in three, three minutes or something like that. Um, based on some statistics, um, or if the user selects um, a, a more expensive but faster transfer, it will basically submit it immediately and then it's the fastest possible outcome from um, Panto's um, side basically, but we still have to confirm it on each of the blockchains. Mm -hmm. um, that there's no way around that because we have, especially on the source blockchain, we cannot um, submit the transfer to the destination blockchain before it's really 100% confirmed. On the before you have blockchain. Uh, finality on, on the blockchain. Exactly. Okay. So uh, based on the blockchain technology or the blockchains that are bridged uh, can be instant or take a little while. Um, so then uh, also a question with, with regards to Pantos, um, how will Pantos be decentralized? Like kind of, can you maybe give us um, some, some insights into your roadmap? Yeah, I mean, for us, the whole um, protocol, um, also, so we understand it as, as an evolutionary process. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we are starting now with some of the components already being decentralized. So we have at the moment two different types of nodes, service nodes and, and um, the validator. Um, the service nodes, they are from, from, from the beginning basically decentralized. That's a, a completely um, permissionless um, and, and decentralized um, way how they operate, so everyone can in fact operate a service node. That's decentralized. The validators are not yet um, decentralized, but we are um, in the process of, of doing that. Um, so we'll um, basically, in an evolutionary way, step by step, um, evolve the Pantos um, protocol until in the end, um, we aim to be fully decentralized. In the end, even not just the validation, but even the, the decisions on, on um, how to proceed with Pantos. So even, mm -hmm. even um, which blockchains to integrate and things like that. But that's much far, um, more um, down the road. In the future, road. yes. Yeah. Exactly. So next steps, basically making the validators um, decentralized. Um, we, um, we have done a lot of research in that regard. There's still some ongoing research here, so um, it will probably involve some kind of staking, but yeah, um, more details will be announced soon. Announced <laughs> as soon as they're available. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe, um, I mean, talking about roadmaps, maybe let's take a step back and talk more like about future trends in, in the interoperability sector. Uh, maybe Alex, like uh, what are the current discussions with regards to like future functionalities, future technical solutions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the big future trends is um, development in hybrid connectors, connecting um, public and private blockchains with each other, for example. Um, this is also highlighted by um, Bell here and his research team, the paper that was cited mm -hmm. before. Um, it is the newest approach of blockchain interoperability mechanisms. Um, yeah, and this, um, it still takes a, some time until robust um, solutions can be implemented uh, because it still needs to be um, tested. And mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I mean, from our discussions, I know that you also take an active interest in not only public blockchains but also private. So I guess. From a banking perspective, uh, hybrid connectors would be something interesting? Yes, definitely. So how we see the whole topic of interoperability is a bit broader. So we're not limiting ourselves just on blockchain interoperability. So the interoperability between public blockchains and also public pl private blockchains, but also looking at the broader field of how to connect uh, on one side blockchain networks and on the other side traditional systems. Mm -hmm. um, because we do believe that there are still, these two systems still will coexist for at least some time. And if we want to do some steps in this field, we also have to connect these two systems. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, as already mentioned, we, we are looking on, on all, um, all different areas. So mm -hmm. understanding also the interoperability a bit broader. Mm -hmm. And um, Leon, Mark, uh, from uh, how, how do you see it? Where, where does the trend 
or where does the, the interesting trends in interoperability go? Um, well, maybe we can we can also regarding that question take take maybe a look at our roadmap and then try to incorporate it somehow. So, uh, like I said, the, the the first step then in our our first big milestone would be the launch of the open beta. Uh, but uh, we are very very interested in the, in multi chain approach. So so mm -hmm. multi chain is like uh, uh, our our top approach and, and and the stuff that is l most interesting for us. And um, also something that is very very important for us is to uh, bring a sort of a multi-chain solution that is uh, really suitable for the broad public mm -hmm. and uh, from what we've seen so far or from uh, or in our humble opinion is that the majority of web free solutions or also blockchain interoperability solutions don't have the necessary ui or ux to to, to bring it to the broad public essentially mm -hmm. uh, and um, so uh, we thought that like uh, it has to be as simple as possible to to to, to be accessible to the end user and um, on, on that note, uh, Marcus teased it before, uh, at, and on that note, on, in the heart of those considerations is basically our token creator tool, um, mm -hmm. which he, he briefly uh, touched on before. Uh, and this essentially enables everybody to create his or her own multi-chain token with just a few clicks. Mm -hmm. And this is all then possible via, via our platform. It will be possible in the near future. Uh, and we will have two options. So one will be uh, for, for somebody who is really unexperienced uh, with, for example, with coding or, or with programming it that you will, like I said, with literally 15 clicks, will be able through our Panthos workflow, uh, be able to deploy your own multi-chain token. Mm -hmm. Then you can basically select on, on which chains you want the token to live on. And the, the other option would then be uh, in this regard, if you're more experienced, for example, if you're a developer, you can download the source code, you can adjust it to your own needs and wants, and you can uh, also implement uh, something on top of it and then uh, essentially launch it through our uh, Panthos infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a, a one of the features we are most excited about and, and we will hope that uh, then in the future a lot of people <coughs> will, will launch their own multi-chain tokens on, <laughs> on top of our own infrastructure. Uh, I mean, I think it's a fair bet to say that uh, the people will come if you think about what's happening in the web free space, in gaming, um, where interoperability or uh, well, where interoperability is one of the biggest use cases or has one of its biggest use cases. So you are uh, giving a platform for, for these people to develop their um, develop their own tokens for, for their web free. Also, yes, but, but essentially anybody who is interested in, in, launching, in launching his or her own token, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so this uh, could, for example, also be used uh, to create some payment rails, which uh, uh, as you said in the beginning, uh, payment is something that's very interesting for you. Definitely. Yeah. So we are really now trying to figure out how the whole payment uh, ecosystem will look like in the future. So there are multiple um, stablecoin issuers. Some are more public, some are more private. Um, and here we're trying to, to figure out how um, how the future will look like and I believe that now especially also with the new regulation so Mika is, is coming um, next year and with the positive interest rate environment this will also uh, create a good environment for, for more euro based, based stable coins and because this is also part of our business I believe that um, yeah such solutions will definitely be needed. Mm. Okay. Great to hear. <laughs> Maybe let's take a look in, into the questions from the audience. Um, so, or something about the current news. Uh, Bitpanda and N26 uh, announced the cooperation today. And uh, here we have the question, will N26 users get access to Pantos? Uh, so, so at the moment, this is something that is not yet in the pipeline because, uh, of course, as it was recently announced today, that now through our uh, Bitpanda white label solution, customers that, that use N26 can also now have access to over 200 cryptos. Uh, and uh, it is uh, essentially, it is, it is an interesting point, but uh, not yet in the, in the pipeline. Okay. Um, so how much do Team Pantos rely on, uh, rely on funds from the university and Bitpanda? Uh, can you like maybe talk a little bit about your funding or you like the business perspective behind Pantos? Yeah, of course. Uh, so um, we essentially had an ICO in, in 2017 where mm -hmm. we collected 616 Bitcoin. Um, and and, and those is, uh, that is, for example, also a, a, a source of funding that is available to us. Uh, but of course, like I said also at the beginning of this talk, 
that uh, Bitpanda is, is, is and, and always uh, has been behind us. Uh, also in terms of, uh, for example, hiring new people, uh, in terms of uh, bringing a structure into the team, and also in terms of, uh, of leadership. Um, so, yeah, and maybe you want to say something about the universities. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, for the universities, we have this um, CDL bot um, project, which is um, funded partly um, by the Austrian government and um, partly by us, um, Pantos, and mm -hmm. also by the um, second industry partner, which is IOTA. And yeah, those researchers, which um, bring a very valuable um, results for us, they are partly funded by us and partly funded by others, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, a very interesting uh, discussion so far. Uh, let's uh, take a look uh, in the chat if we have some more. Um, uh, also a very technical question from your community. I, I don't know if you can, can give an answer on that. Uh, uh, will PAN, like the PAN, your token, be listed on other exchanges? Uh, well, I, I think that eventually this is, this is going to be the course of events, right? As, 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 as the open beta approaches and then in the future also mainnet launches, this will uh, inevitably be the, uh, be the, the case at some point. Uh, but as of now, um, it's, it's, I, it's, it's, I, I, I can't say anything more about it, I would say, yeah. <laughs> uh, but now with the Panto solution in place, you could like move the Pantos token somewhere else and uh, see if you can find an exchange there. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so maybe like as a final round, like um, what do you uh, expect uh, for the near term future to, to happen in the interoperability field? Um, what do you have uh, think about like the midterm future, like in you know three years, uh, just from your own perspective and you from your own approach to interoperability? M maybe let's start with Wit. Mm, I'll leave the technical side to, to <laughs> others, but from banking perspective, um, we believe that we have to have this challenge in mind when we're developing a solution. Um, and there are a lot of um, things going on, especially as I mentioned on the payment side with stable coins and uh, tokenized asset side. So this is definitely part that we um, will have in mind. And we definitely also support projects that help us um, to, to bridge this uh, blockchain interoperability um, challenge. Mm -hmm. Alex? Yeah. So I think in the next years, um, projects like Pantos will improve the, the usability for the end users. So it will be much easier to um, conduct, for example, token transfers from one blockchain to another just with a few clicks. And then I think that's a really important point um, to get higher user adoption. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, development in hybrid connectors we will see in the next year, next few years. Um, yeah. So we will see these hitting the market going from concept to implementation. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I also, I'm, I'm going to leave the technical stuff to Marcus. <laughs> um, uh, but maybe, maybe also uh, from my side, I think that definitely on user experience and user interface side, there's going to be a lot of improvements mm -hmm. because I think in its end state, ideally a multi-chain with free solution would just be like this, this thin layer of infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, that the user doesn't really know exists. Mm -hmm. So the, the complex machinery that balances fees, that balances liquidity, that uh, makes sure that security is in place, mm -hmm. doesn't need to be exposed to the end user. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that uh, this is something uh, that really needs to happen for this technology to gain uh, mainstream adoption uh, and something that we already try to implement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, on the protocol side, I would say that um, the, at the moment we have a number of different um, multi-chain uh, protocols and they will mature or the ones which don't will more or less um, disappear, I, I would say. So people will will focus on the ones which work better than the others in terms of, in terms of security, for example. I think um, for the ones which establish themselves, you will see less exploits uh, than we saw in the, in, in the past. Um, yeah, things similar to the blockchain space, uh, so to, to, the, to the single blockchain space, I mean, not to the multi-chain space, um, which is a little bit um, further, uh, I think, uh, so, so uh, you will see that some projects will become the major ones, they will be um, the secure ones, the more decentralized ones, I think, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I would expect. So we, see, we will see a market consolidation in, in the near future with winners emerging. Yeah. 
and uh, let's hope Pantos uh, is one of them. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> Definitely. I think you're working hard on it and uh, uh, I think you have a good solution. And so I say thank you to all of uh, us for sharing uh, your insights into the op interoperability space with us and the audience. Um, and uh, if there are no more questions in, in the chat, um, I would close uh, this uh, ABC blockchain talk and say thank you all of you for joining us online. Uh, and don't forget to check out uh, our website and our LinkedIn for the announcement of the next blockchain talk. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.